What's going on, everyone? Welcome to another edition of the Victory Life Legacy Spotlight. I have with me today a hometown friend, uh, DJ Parker, the great safety, multi-sport athlete from the 757. Played at my rival, Phoebus, <laughs> but ended up becoming uh, one of my, my, my brothers in the Hokey Nation at Virginia Tech. So I'm happy to have you on. DJ, how you doing? Hey, I'm doing good, man. I'm blessed, man. It's, it's, it's an honor to, to be talking to you, man. Uh, you know, I always call you the OG, and uh, so it's an honor to be talking to you right now. So, so thanks for having me. Yeah, man. No, thanks for jumping on, man. I appreciate the love, and uh, we're going to talk about that, the OG and, you know, the Hampton uh, Peninsula District and, and, and those things like that and playing at Phoebus. When you were coming up, you know, you're younger than me. Um, you played your high school ball at Phoebus, but before you got to Phoebus, were you familiar with the, I know one time I tweeted about Marcus Hagens and you, you quickly responded and talked about how you were a big fan and you respected him. What do you remember about watching the guys before you were in the Peninsula District? Yeah, it's like, yeah, Hagen's one of those guys, man, who I looked up to. But you know, the funny thing for me is, man, you know, I grew up, grew up in Hampton, Virginia, for people that don't know, and I played in the, you know, the city rec. You know, Hampton Rex. So, you know, I grew up watching those guys and, and wanted, to, wanted to be like them, you know. And um, it's funny, uh, I, I, grew, I my house that I grew up in is right down the street from Dollar Stadium. So I grew up on Victoria Boulevard. So oh. you can literally walk out my door. Uh, you know where the Wilkes Barbecue is right there on the corner. Yes, I do. I live right by the Wilkes. So I can, you know, we used to walk down when we were youngins, you know, Friday nights, you know, with our, our Rec League jerseys on. And go down yep. and, and watch the games, you know. So, you know, we were, we were big fans. You know, of course, Ron, Ron Curry, uh, that dude was like a god to me, man. Like, you know, he like he was everything. So he's the one who really, you know, uh, a lot of inspiration and wanted me to kind of, kind of go down that path and, and play sports and continue continue down that road. Uh, but you know, Hagens was another big one, man, who I just admired so much. Uh, Antoine Womack, mm. you know, Antoine Womack was like a legend as well. Yes, he was. So he, he was the guy who who, who named Rum Bells and you know in the in the Phoebus area. So there were a lot of guys who I looked up to, man, as well. You know, Javon Quillen being another one, played quarterback at Kitan High. You know, those guys were the athletes, they had all the swag. You know, you kind of just want to kind of emulate those guys and, and be like them as a as a young. And so um, I look, I watch those guys a lot. And and when you talk about uh rec ball, uh who'd you play for? Who was your team? Yes, I played for the East Hampton Gators. So okay. I, was, I was an East Hampton Gator, um, you know, and it was funny. I almost went to YH Thomas because YH Thomas was the team to play for. Um, they had all the athletes. They had all the, all the, all the young stars. But um, my pops ended up signing me. First, we, I was with Southampton Bears, and then uh, I think that team folded, and then we converted over to East Hampton. Um, so we were in that league for a long time um, until it was time for me to, to move on up and uh, to test out JD. Yeah. And you uh, talk about the nights, uh, the Friday night lights in Darling Stadium, which for decades was, was a special place to be. I mean, you know, you see the stuff in Texas and you hear about the stories in Florida, but very similar in, in the Hampton Roads area, especially on our side of the Peninsula District, Friday night lights was special. Um, Darling Stadium yeah. just had a special feel to it. But um, you ended up going to Phoebus and you played for the legendary Coach Bill D. And you played with some studs. Um, yeah. Who were the guys, who were some of the guys you played with at Fevers? Yeah, so uh, Xavier Deeby uh, you know, was a guy who was like my best friend from my eighth grade on, on up. Uh, played with the Xavier, he was our fullback defensive end. Uh, Phillip Brown was another All-American we had. You know, he played, he was all world. He turned punts, played quarterback, running back. He did it all, played DB. Um, Elon Lewis was another running back, man. He broke a lot of records. I don't want to say he's probably the top five rushing in the state of Virginia. Um, played with him as well. Um, and a lot of people don't know, we had a really good quarterback who, you know, rest his soul, he passed away, Ronnie Hendricks. Yeah. Um, he was the first quarterback to win the state championship at Phoebus. Um, you know, he, he really kind of, you know, he, he, he set it all for us. And, um, you know, so once he passed away, you know, I, I stepped in and, and played quarterback my senior and uh, I just tried to keep that tradition going and then took it off from there. But those are some guys that really stood out to me who I played with. Um, you know, we didn't get a chance to talk last time I interviewed you for my column several years ago. But, you know, before we get into the, the, the Phoebus uh, games, the state championships and, and playing for Coach D, um, talk about your family life, man. You know, we're from a city um, 
in that whole side, Peninsula District, you know, you talk about Hampton and Newport News. We focus so much on the great athletes that come from down there. You mentioned Marcus Higgins and the Taj Boys and the DB Brothers and so many great players. We can go on and on. But a lot of guys don't come out and reach their full potential because of get the opportunity that they miss on by getting caught up. Um, what was it like? You you always seemed well-grounded. You know, even before you and I met, I knew of you and I knew guys that knew you, coaches. I've heard coaches speak about you. You always well-grounded and focused. Does that start? for you at home? Like, what was it like growing up and not getting caught up? Yeah, man, I, all credit to, to my family, man, really close family, uh, my mom, my mother and my father. You know, I, I was blessed to to have those both in the house um, under, under one roof. And, uh, you know, I basically, uh, you know, they, they, didn't, they didn't talk to me much. They just did everything by their actions. Mm -hmm. You know, both mom and dad worked, worked two jobs uh, around the clock. You know, they work one, you know, get off at five or six, Come shower, make sure we had something to eat, and they go on to another one, you know, um, you know, at night to make sure, you know, we had everything we needed. So um, just being around them, man, and kind of getting that structure from them, then really leaning on my grandmother, who was always in my life, always there, always in my ear, uh, making sure I was going on the right path, you know. Um, you know, they stayed on top of my, my brother and I and make sure that, uh, you know, we didn't, we didn't fall with the wrong crowd, and, you know, we kind of stayed on that straight arrow. Yeah, yeah, man, you were blessed by that, man. Even when I see you on Twitter, I always like watching your tweets, man. You, you, if anybody watching, hold on. What's your Twitter handle so for people to see this? What is it? Ah, uh, like a DJ Parker twenty five, I believe. If you yeah. follow him, you're gonna get some witty, yeah. some some witty comments, some uh, sarcasm, but some great insight and intelligence. You are you are great to follow, man. I, I like watching you because you just come with it, and you just get off, or you come with yeah. like two tweets and you get off. I'm um, random. Yeah. yeah, yeah, but it's great to follow you. Um. You mentioned Antoine Womack. When I was a senior, he was a freshman. Um, and, you know, I played at Hampton. And I don't think, I mean, I, I think it evolved into that. And I know you and I know about it. But prior to Hampton and Phoebus, for, for years, Hampton and Bethel was the rivalry. Even before Iverson and Ronald Curry and all those guys, you go back to the 70s and 80s. Those were the two top teams. And then what I remember when I was at Hampton is um, Bill D came into the fold. He took over at Phoebus. And Phoebus and Hampton, even now, were always a lot alike. You know, you had Kiki Tan and Bethel. You know, I, I, I interviewed Damon Bakold and Tony Rutland. We always teased Tony because we always felt Bethel were pretty boys. You yeah. know, they, 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 they were a little bit built different. Not to say they weren't ballers. And then you had Kiki Tan, um, you know, which was on the nicer part of town, you know, near Fox Hill and all of that. But Hampton and Phoebus um, were, were gritty. And they were built, not so much the landscape of the schools, but the players there um, were built the same. They, they, they both played with that attitude. It was physical. And when I reflect wow. on Hampton and Phoebus games, I remember, I mean, after the game just being sore. I played against, you know, uh, Carrington and uh, Torrey Edge and Jerron Coleman. Just, not Jerron Coleman, excuse me, that's Norcom. But they had some guys that were just phenomenal athletes, and the games were sold out. And it was just, it was just like must see TV. To, you know, of course, we had Channel Forty Six and Channel Forty Eight. Um, you mentioned when you got to Phoebus, how was it like to play for the legendary coach Bill D? It was great, man. It, it was an honor. You know, um, I never played for a coach who just. I think coach playing for Coach D helped me uh, and prepared me for college. Uh, I tell people all the time. I said, man. Tech two of days were, were nothing to me. It was easy. <laughs> because if you can get through a Bill D practice and a Bill D two a day, you can get through anything, man. Mm -hmm. You know, Coach D was old school. As you know, we ran the ball, you know, 70 times a game. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that was his style, man. We we're going to be tough. We we're going to be hard nosed, man. We we're going to play tough defense and we we're going to run the ball, man. So Coach D, man, he, 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 didn't, he, didn't, he didn't cut you any slack. You know, he stayed on you. And uh, he, he really brought the best out of you. But it, it was great times, man. I remember being a skinny freshman, man. Uh, my, my, my freshman year, I played JV. And uh, I was hoping to kind of, you know, split JV varsity, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, even though I knew I wasn't going to get in the games on, on Friday nights. But I still wanted to have that varsity jersey. But, um, you know, I came in and, and JV and uh, Coach, he just had faith in me from day one. Um, you know, and he stuck with me. He worked with me. He just saw something in me, man. And. I think it was the way I carried myself and my work ethic that I think coach like gravitated towards me and say, I think this kid's going to be pretty special. Let me make sure I stay on him. 
So it was, it was always a blessing and an honor to them and that, that coaches had a lot of faith in me and, and, and kept working with me. And uh, it, it was great times playing with me. And you played, you mentioned you eventually played quarterback. What are the positions that you play? Yes, yeah, so when I first got there, uh, it's funny. So I was the starting JV quarterback. And then um, our varsity quarterback, injury, he, he was coming to his own. So when I got moved up to varsity my sophomore year, I moved over to wide receiver. So I ended up playing wide receiver and cornerback. So those are my two positions. Um, my senior year came up. We didn't have a, have a QB. So Coach D was like, hey, you know, we need you back at QB. And I, didn't, I wasn't happy about it because I'm like, I'm doing my thing at receiver. You know, I'm like, I had good numbers last year. You know, I'm trying to get scouted and recruited as a receiver. <laughs> so I took them for the team and, you know, went underneath the center, man. And it was a blessing. We ended up going 14 and 0 winning state. So it worked out. Who did y'all beat in the states? I can't remember. We beat Stafford. Okay. All right. We beat Stafford. Um, I don't – I remember they had a really good running back that year. He ended up signing going to Tech. Can't remember the kid's name. I should know um, this, though. Yeah, he was like the, the highlight player. But we, we went up there, man. I think we beat him like 40 to 13, something like that. It really wasn't a game, man. And uh, yeah, we, we beat them. Um, my junior year, we ended up beating. Uh, we beat team from Richmond. Um, I can't remember who it was. Uh, slipping my mind, but we beat them as well back to back, man. But those those are good times, man. I know getting that first one was a blessing for us because I know personally, man. Like I think I'm not the only one who thought this, but we looked up to you guys, Hampton High. Like y'all were the, the top. You know, y'all had the swag. Y'all had the wins, y'all had the rings, y'all basically had the city on lock. We knew we, if we wanted to get there, we had to go through y'all, which has been a struggle for us, you know, seeing y'all every year because y'all were so dominant, man. So y'all set the bar so high for us, man. I know growing up with me, in my years, Hampton High was it. So I know we wanted to kind of get to that level. Um, we got to step our game up to, you know, compete with you guys. So once we kind of got down hump a little bit, we kind of even out that rivalry, man, that's when it got good and got fun. Yeah, you know what, that's, and that's true. And I mean, I understand what you mean, too, because what I remember about playing Phoebus, they only, in my four years, I was a four-year varsity player, started three years, uh, 10th, 11th, and 12th. And I remember my ninth grade year on varsity, um, and there was a full moon that night, and you guys ran that option, like Georgia Tech. <laughs> and if you, missed your, if you missed your assignment on defense, it was lights out, it was six, or it was a big game. But I remember you guys upset us, and we won a win streak from the year before, and um, and it was I remember um, that win in the following year we 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 beat you guys, but it was always a battle. And I also remember um, even when I uh, came back home one time when I was at Tech, when Ronald um, ended up beating Phoebus, he threw the pass to Noel Rainey in the corner yeah. of the end zone, and they won. It was a two point conversion. They won twenty two twenty one, and I kept thinking, man, Phoebus. They get us, but they pretty much always lose and come, come short. It was always a close game. And then all of a sudden, when I come back home, because, you know, when, even when you're away in college, you check, out, you know, what's going on. I see you and the DV and all you guys. I was like, oh, Phoebus then really can't. I mean, it was, it was a situation where, you know, the, it wasn't so much the tie to turn, but the legacy had been fulfilled in the fact that Bill D had gotten to that zone where he understood how to evolve as a coach, even with his offense and the players. I mean, and it was great to see because it, it's a battle, but then if somebody wins it from the Peninsula District, you're excited about that. Um, right. When you talk about um, that rivalry, man, who do you remember playing against from Hampton? And, 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 and not just Hampton, but the Peninsula District. I've always said in previous uh, spotlights uh, guys from back home, that time, basically the late 80s into the early 2000s, your era, was the golden era for, yeah. for, the, for the 757 area and the Peninsula District. Um, what do you remember about the Hampton and Phoebus robbery during your era and also the other teams and other players you played in, against in the Peninsula District? Yeah, for sure, man. So starting off with the robbery, man, I mean, of course, you know, I played against Higgins. Another guy who I looked up to and who I thought was just this incredible player, man, was Carlos Campbell. Yeah. Uh, you know, Los and Zan 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 Yeah, yeah, Los was at Phoebus. He was all the world at Phoebus and then, you know, you know, transferring, going to hand, and that kind of, you know, started this little thing because he was our star player. He went over there and left us, but um, playing against him and watching him, he was awesome, man. Great player, great athlete, um, you know. Um, and then I think it was that my, my freshman year when Hampton had a, this backfield. It was Chuck Forte and um, it's another back, man. Chuck Forte. Uh, I can't remember the other back's name. 
but that was probably the biggest backfield I've ever seen that we ever played against, man. And then, of course, uh, Alvin Banks was another another really good running back from Hampton High who we played against. But then also, like, Kikitan, um, they had Gerard Mayo. Yes. Linebacker. Linebacker was an animal. Yeah, Gerard was a beast, um, you know, all over the field. We had some really good battles with them um, regular season and also, like, you know, in the early in the playoffs. We had a, we had a fight um, to get through them, for sure. Um, another team who we never lost to, we all beat up beat up on, uh, was Dendy. But Antoine Bethe was <laughs> a dog. <laughs> you know, all over the field, flying around. Um, you know, he he was he was someone we had to account for, man. So he's another guy who stood out to me. They probably didn't win a lot of games, but you remember Antoine for sure, because he was he was a, he was a baller. Um, and there's just some other other schools out there, man. You know, um, you know Woodside. I feel like my junior senior year, they were like coming on pretty strong. Had some, they had two twins on their team, um, both were like six four, six five. Um, I think they were going to Delaware or something like that. Um, but during that time, they were really good players, man. But um, for the most part, man, we just we handled our business. You know, I think once we kind of got into our groove and found our identity, man, um, it, it, it was it, it was nothing stopping us at that point. Um, of course, the Hampton the Fevers game, man, that was just the game. You know, I, you know, living where I live, it seemed like Friday night when the lights turned on, it seemed like the stadium lit up the whole city. It did. It did. It lit up the whole city. It did. And um, you, you know, you see all the cars parked down the down the street, and you knew what time it was, man. And you just the crowd, man. I remember they used to bring extra bleachers out for that game. Yeah. So and my game. dad, my dad, I was already gone, but even when I was there, when I played, you had to get there. You had to buy your tickets early in the week. Really? And if you tried to buy them the day of, you were gonna stand in line for an hour and a half. Stand in line. I remember I was standing outside the gate, trying to at least get a peek, you know, just to watch the game, man. And that was, that was the game, man. And, of course, you know, the, the bands, you know, you know, our, both of our bands were, were awesome bands. And they rocking back and forth, competing in, your, in the stands. And the game was always good, man. That, that was the game to see, man, the game to be a part of. I, I miss those days. You know what, man? It's a, it's a lot of nostalgia around that because I forgot about Phoebus' legendary band. I remember um, when you guys, I mean, again, you weren't there yet. But in my time, when they ended up going across the water, we played Norcom first. Mm -hmm. And they played them um, the same time or after us or whatever in the playoffs. I remember that was a big game because Norcom's band and Phoebus' band were legendary. I mean, you're talking yeah. about they were collegiate style bands, the size, mm -hmm. the number of members, the songs they played. I mean, it was a nostalgia. Do you think, well, before you ask about the Peninsula District now, I do got to ask you this because I want some hot takes. Yeah. What, did, what did Coach Bill D, did, you know, again, um, this is not about anything negative, but what was his thoughts? I mean, because, you know, we, we are not at your practices. What did he say about him and Mike Smith? Was there any, not so much comments made, but when he was giving a scouting report or his, his mindset in preparing y'all, what was his take on Hampton? Or did he say something motivational? Or was it something personal? Because I always felt like they had a great respect for each other. But you know how it is when you're a player. Is there mm -hmm. something saying like, hey man, we're gonna bust that? Well, you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> what did he say <laughs> when he was preparing y'all in, in that for that Hampton game when it was Hampton week? Yeah, I'll tell you this, man. Coach, Coach, Coach D, Coach Sexton, and the whole staff, I think they hated Hampton High, man. I think they hated Mike Smith <laughs> and, and Coach Danny Rush his soul too, you know. But they respected them. They respected yeah. them so much. God damn, a lot of respect for those guys. But they were competitive. They hated those guys. I think they really wanted to beat them. So they instill that in us, you know what I'm saying? Like, hey, we gotta hate those guys. You know, they they think they're all this. People who know Coach D, man, he, he used to cuss like a sailor, man. Yeah, he did. Yeah, it yeah. wasn't a word he wouldn't say, you know. So <laughs> we heard it all when it came to that week, man. He would he would he was saying it all, and um, you could tell it was a, a different type of practice that week when it was Hampton week. He was fired up, intense. Practice was probably three hours long. Um, you know, uh, we were in the, in the weight room, you know, an extra day or two, things like that, man. And um, I think what I think he knew, we wanted to get to the top of the field, you all. So, he, you know, he, you know, I think he, he respects those guys a lot, but I think him and Mike Smith, I didn't think he liked them too much when he came to on, on the field. But he yeah, yeah, yeah. The field. yeah. You know, I've been dying to ask you this question and, and not, and I wasn't going to do it over Twitter, you know, because, you know, Twitter, even if I DM'd you, you know, when you tweet or you texting, you can't get a feel for an answer. 
But yeah. um, I got Brendan Hill. I know you yeah. guys all hang D'Angelo, all you guys. Um, what does he say? Or what are your thoughts, I should say? Because Brendan Hill and I had a conversation on Twitter one time, and then he kind of just went on him. He's like me. Once he going, he went on his rant about the not so much the demise or fall, but you know, many of us that played in that era, um, we ended up moving up to Northern Virginia, Maryland, and DC because the the economy and the job market in the Hampton Roads area is different. It's not as lucrative as it is in Northern Virginia. Yeah. And he went on and on about, you know, that affects, you know, some of the play that you see, especially in the football realm. And I don't know if you keep up, but, you know, Phoebus, they've been in a few state championships here lately. But when I look at them in Hampton, I mean, Hampton lost to Gloucester. Gloucester beat Hampton, Ticketan, and Bethel this year. Which is crazy because, you know, growing up, Gloucester was like a – yeah. Yeah, you know, we should stop them out. <laughs> yeah, and I'm saying, I mean, again, I don't want to make it seem like there's the talent is still there, but at the same time, what are your thoughts on what's happened? Because, you know, when I mention the goal there, it's not so much that, you know, I don't think the kids they are playing not are not playing hard, but I mean, it's not the same in regards to having the legendary coach that you had at Bethel, yeah. uh, Coach Newsom at Kickitan, you had Bill D, you had Coach Mike Smith, who's still at Hampton. Yeah. Um but it's not the same as far as we would send six or seven teams to the playoffs and we went across the water, you know, we knew we were the better district. Um, the South side is kind of taking over and really the region as a whole, they're not dominating the state championships. Maury did win it this past year, but it's not the same as it was even in the 2000s when you and Taj and all you guys there, DB brothers, what is your take on it? What, what do you think has transpired? I mean, it's not a right or wrong answer. I just want to know your thoughts. Yeah, I don't know, Vic. You know, I think that it was different, man. Like, you, you, I think you hit it on the head, man. When we were playing, we had the legendary coaches, you know, and they were the staple of the program. They built those programs from the bottom up. And, you know, for me, you know, being a youngin', you know, I didn't have an older brother, but I had, you know, older friends and cousins who played for those coaches. You know what I'm saying? So it's kind of like a tradition to where you wanted to play ball and you wanted to play ball for this school and you wanted to play for this coach. Um, I think now, man, with what's going on, I think they've done a lot of rezoning. You know, a, a lot of the areas there was probably hurt a lot of kids, um, shipping them to different different zones and things like that, far as school wise. And I, I just probably think maybe you know the, a lot of kids who were just passionate about the game and playing anymore, man. Like I think I went to a game a while back, a Phoebus game. I would say, man, I probably saw about twenty five kids on the sideline. I'm like, man, you didn't even got enough players to play. I know. <laughs> you know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, back when we played, you, you used to have 50, 60 kids. You know. Um, so I, I just think it's just, it's just a, the times are different, man, especially on our side. You know, I really don't know what it is. I wish I could put my finger on it. You know, maybe I just, like, my fault should get back more and kind of find out, you know, what's going on and, you know, get my ear to the streets. But it's just a different time, man. And, you know, it's unfortunate that, you know, you don't see, like, the powerhouses, the Phoebus, the, the Bethels, the Hampton Highs, you know, at the top of their game right now. Um, and the, the momentum has switched over to, you know, across, across the board. Like you said, Maury won and things like that. You see um, – uh, what's the school over there in Chesapeake? Oscar um, Smith. Oscar Smith, they dominating every year. So mm -hmm. um, you hear about those guys, man. And they, even like the old schools, like, like the Deep Creeks. You know, Deep Creek used to be a, a monster. You know, they had the Hymans, they had D. Hall, they had, um, you know, they had all those guys. You know, J James Anderson, you know, the guys who, who were dogs over there. Um, but you kind of see it's just like, you know, it's just right here and there, man. I hope it, it gets better. I hope kids, you know, get more passionate about the game and, and really, you know, uh, just get out there and just play, man. Just it's just different times these days. I don't know. Yeah, it is. No, and again, I, I've had this conversation with a few people, and it's just interesting to me because I know things change. I mean, look at our university, which you get on second tech. Yeah. I mean, you know, you went there and you guys took off with the ACC championships, but I know things come in cycles, and I understand that. And I'm not that OG that you know feels like oh, um, these guys are soft. I don't even think like that. I think it's more so just. Is different. And I, I just hope it gets back because, you know, I don't live and die with my high school, but at the same time, you want to, you want them to see them be successful. You want to see them do well. And when I used to come back home, you know, whether it was a bye week or I'm home visiting my family and it was around the holidays, I watching that Hampton Phoebus game, it, it led up usually to the Virginia Tech UVA game. It was like rivalry week. You know, like you had Hampton Phoebus, 
<laughs> and then you had Virginia Tech, UVA, and then on, you know, maybe you got lucky and had the Cowboys and the Redskins. Yes, sir. You know what I'm saying? So it was like, and it was just, you know, overwhelming, but it was a good overwhelming. Um, you know, so you played for Coach D, and you had a great run with the DB brothers and all the guys you played with, man. Um, were you weren't really a highly touted recruit though, like a uh, DB, like Xavier, like he. He, Xavier DB, you know, was one of the best linebackers, one of the best athletes in the country. Um, your journey was a little bit different. You were at a great program. You had some interest, but it wasn't like, you know, people were just knocking down the door to get at you. How'd you end up choosing tech? But before you end up, how you end up choosing tech, who showed interest and how did that whole thing come about as far as your recruitment? Yeah, so I, I, was, getting, I was getting looks from everyone, you know, and being blessed with a DB and playing with Philip Brown, who were all Americans at the time, schools were coming to see those guys. So when they came to see them, they, and they said, who's this number seven out there? And they started, they started talking to Coach D about it. And, but the one thing I can say, Vic, man, be honest with you, man, I wasn't, uh, I wasn't a big, big, big uh, academic person. I didn't take school serious. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Uh, the talent was there. I could, you know, I, I could play with the best. Now I had D1 talent, but my, my grades wasn't D1. So I think that scared a lot of schools, you know. Um, I was getting the letters, you know, you know, the, the scouts and the coaches would come to school. They, they would talk to me, you know, and they were very interested. But then they, they look at my transcripts and they, you know, they say, oh, I don't know. Um, you know, so going into my senior year, for whatever reason, man, school just didn't click with me. I still didn't take it serious. I just wanted to play ball. And uh, I, I wasn't recruited, you know, I uh, wasn't highly recruited at all. Um, you know, it's funny, like I, I said a tweet, you know, like I didn't even have, HBCU was calling out like HU wow. Murphy State. I didn't, I didn't hear from nobody, you know. <laughs> so it was crazy, you know. Um, one thing was a blessing though, man. Uh, you know, uh, Xavier's brother Nathaniel was playing at Tech at the time. Yeah. And, and Xavier and I were best friends. He asked me, he's like, "Hey, you want to go to the Tech game? Tech is playing LSU." I'm like, "Yeah, for sure." Well, that game was a. I yeah, don't know where was, I was. That was a, that was a, the one at Tech, right? When that tech, when Kevin yeah. Jones went ham, Kevin Jones went crazy. <laughs> so that was my first college game, first experience ever. When I went there, I was like, and my cousin oh, got his man. number. My cousin, that was the game when Mike got his number, uh, whatever yeah. that flagpole uh, thing when they, he yep. held up the frame jersey. Exactly. Yeah. So that was my first exposure to that. So that was crazy. So I knew then I was like, all right, like, and I didn't know much too much about Virginia Tech. You know, you know, funny story. I was actually over his house, and this was when Nathaniel was a senior. He was coming out. So I'm asking him, I'm like, Bub, like, what, what, what you thinking, man? Where, where you going? What school you going to? He was like, man, it's probably between Virginia Tech or Penn State. I'm like, oh, are you going to Penn State? That's easy, you know, because it's Penn State. You know what I'm saying? But he's like, nah, I think I'm going to go to Virginia Tech. I'm like, Virginia Tech? Like, look at that, you know? <laughs> Virginia Tech. He like, trust me. They like, they up and coming. And I'm like, I, I kid you not, man, that was the year, the 99 year, man. They went crazy. Mm -hmm. And Mike was there, you know, they, they lit it up. And I was like, Oh wow, like this is different. So that was my first exposure to that. Um, but going back, man, it was funny. Like my senior year, uh, it wasn't a lot of interest, man. I had great numbers, and I was all district, all state. Uh, we just come off a state championship, and the offers just weren't weren't coming in. But I knew why because my my, my grades wasn't right, and I didn't have my scores. Uh, but luckily, man, you know my man for life, Coach Cavanaugh, Jim Cavanaugh, great coach. Came great in coach. Man, great man. He came in last minute. And Coach was like the only one who like stayed on. He, you know, he'd check up on me. He come, he'd come to Phoebus. He always asked for me, talk to me, give me some encouragement. And uh, last minute, man, I, I remember the day I got the call from Coach D. He said, hey, look, we know your situation isn't right, but I talked to Coach Cav and they want to extend an offer. And I was like, I was blown away. I was blown away because my mind said, I was already thinking like, all right, man, I'm a I'm gonna graduate from high school, probably you know, go get a job at the shipyard somewhere like everybody else do, and be stuck here in Hampton. You know, were you were you, were you scared when you? Were, I'm asking the honest question. When you were like, well, I'll just stay here, because I again, I remember how that was for me. I had a bunch of offers, but part of my motivation was, and I love homeless. There's nothing against anyone yeah. who's watching this, who's working at rallies or checkers or at the shipyard. It's not about that, but I wanted to see more. And I was yeah. scared. Were you scared? Like, well, you know what? If I don't yeah. get any office, I'm just gonna be here. Was that a, was that a problem that for you? It. That was a big problem for me. That was my reality, big. And I was, I was a little bit embarrassed, man. You know what I'm saying? Because I'm like, dang, like, you know, people, my name is out here a little bit. People know who I am, but I don't want to be that guy. Like, man, whatever happened to DJ? Why, you, why you ain't go play ball nowhere, man? You know what I'm saying? 
and I knew the reason why. And in my reality, I was thinking like, well, this is it. I'm just going to graduate, get a job around here. I'm just going to be stuck in Hampton. And it scared the crap out of me because we all know, man, it ain't much going on around here, man. It ain't, it ain't not moving. You know what I'm saying? Ain't a lot of opportunities, man. So I was a little worried about that. But luckily, man, Jim Cavanaugh came in, Virginia Tech, Coach Beeman came in, man. And they said, hey, we know we want to offer you. Uh, but, you know, you, you got you to gotta go down a different path. And once they laid the path out for me, as um, far as going to prep school, I was like, okay, I think I can do this. And that's when it all clicked for me. I never looked back. Yeah. And when you get to Tech, um did you meet bud foster on your visit <laughs> and did you or did you meet the real bud foster when you got the tech <laughs> I, met the, I met the real bud foster when i got the tech that first day man you know uh, you know winter workouts that's when i met the real bud foster on the visit he was cool calm you could tell he was serious you know he, yeah he talked he talk with you with those big eyes and yep. you know he, he's real serious and stern with you but he's like oh he's a nice guy i can see myself playing for him but uh, once we got to, to like the winter workouts, it was like, uh, it was a different guy. You know, I was like, all right, this is the real Bud Foster who I've been hearing about. Um, mm -hmm. but yeah, he, he was a great guy to play. And, and when you get to, when, you, when you're there at Tech, man, like, um, what, what are your thoughts? You know, when I've interviewed guys, um, I've interviewed UVA and Virginia Tech guys, and even guys that went to other schools in uh, the sports, and they all unanimous, unanimously, yeah. without even knowing each other or being on the same interview, talk about the sudden change, the intensity, the more responsibility and how it can hit you like a ton of bricks. It can overwhelm you. Um, given that you had some academic struggles, you got the tech. Did you feel like, okay, it's time to step up or this is a little bit much. I don't know if I'm going to be able to sustain and maintain here. What were your thoughts when you first get to college and you transition, especially coming from the 75 where we're from, more urban area, you know, the southeastern Virginia, but it's still Newport News, Hampton, North, Norfolk, you know, and you get to Blacksburg, where it's agriculture, it's an engineering school, it's in Southwest Virginia, tucked in the mountains. What was going through your mind when you, I know you visited, but when you finally commit, you're like, okay, I'm here. What were your thoughts? Yeah, actually, man, I would say this, Dick, man, I think prep school at one of Hargrave Military Academy really prepared me for that. Um, Hargrave, if people don't know, it's in Chatham, Virginia, which is in the middle of nowhere. Nowhere, nowhere. Yeah, nowhere, <laughs> man. <laughs> You know, me being you know 18 years old and my, my parents just packing up one bag and just dropping me off there to military school um, to grow up quick. You know, um, luckily enough, I you know once I I got there, I made a promise to Coach Dave, my parents and Coach Cab that you know I was going to get my stuff straight and I was going to get out of here as fast as I can. And luckily, I was only there for a semester. You know, I played the fall ball there and I was able to enroll into Virginia Tech that spring. Um, you know, following that spring, so going to Tech in Blacksburg, man, it was I was comfortable. I was normal, you know. Um, you know, the main thing was me just trying to just catch up because you know my my class was already there, you know, that semester before me. So getting with Vince Hall and DB and Chris Ellis and those guys, I feel like I had to get caught up to those guys because they already had a semester in the weight room and you know food table training table was a little bigger than me. I was like, oh, I got some work to put in, you know. <laughs> um, but but culturally, man, it it was cool for me, man. It was peace. It was. It was good for me because it, it wasn't home. You know, for me, man, we didn't travel a lot as kids. We didn't go, you know, we didn't go any farther than, you know, OBX, man, Nags Head, you know, for a vacation or something like that, man. That's all we knew was just Hampton, Newport News, Virginia Beach, yep. you know, um, the, the, the seven cities. So um, being, being out there in Blasphere, it was cool. It was something different, mm -hmm. man. I just embraced it. You know, when you name my guy Chris Ellis and Vince Hall in Vegas, Okay. okay, you're talking about personalities, right? Yeah. Okay, personally, you know, and, and again, I know, I knew those guys. I knew, I know them, and I knew them when they were there because I was still coming back more. But I got to tell you, man, and I know we had some when I played, and there's been some teams, you know, after me and before me that had personalities, nothing against them. But I remember, and I, you know, I do media work. So, you know, when you're in the press box, you talk to guys, and many people have said in the media, you know, the Daily Press, Virginia Pilot, Richmond Times Dispatch, that was one of the most fun teams to cover because of the personalities. You had Vegas, and you're talking about um, Vince Hall, who were, you know, eating the sunflower seeds, talking to you during the interview like he just back home. You know, Chris Ellis, who was an animal, and he had that attitude and that chip. He had the swag, and he didn't care. But he yeah. wasn't disrespectful, but he was on the field to his opponents. Yeah. I mean, that team, 
I mean, what do you remember about that team? Because you guys ended up being, uh, and help me if I'm, correct me if I'm wrong, number one ranked defense in the nation twice, right? Yeah. Twice, which yeah. is amazing. I mean, we're not talking about, you know, in the ACC, in the nation, but it looked like it was a lot of fun to play on those teams, man, on that defense. It was, man. It was a lot of fun. We were a close-knit group. That 2003 class, man, uh, we did everything together. You know, and we knew that we could be something special. We knew we had all the 757, 804 talent. We just stuck together, man. We can we can be we be very talented. So we had a lot of characters, man. Chris Ellis, Vince Hall, uh, Dwayne Brown was a was a fool. Uh, you know, we had, you know, we had Roland Minor who was just always into something, man. You know, we had to always reel that guy in. Then we had, you know, the great Jimmy Williams, who was just, you know, a wild card. Yes, you know, yes. I know, Jim, I know he know he's from Hampton. I know Jimmy. <laughs> Jimmy was a wild card, man. But we know we 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 you know he was great. He was great. Um, you know, it was just uh, I think that we really pushed Coach to the limit for sure. Um, he had he had a real ascent because we were going off the chain. But that was what, that's how we wanted to play, man. We felt like we needed to be that that to play with that edge. We need to have that freedom. Um, I think we kind of felt you know we, we can talk to this day. Um, a lot of guys feel like we were, you know, constrained a little bit, you know, like Coach Beamer really didn't let us go, you know. Um, I think there was some time, you know, we guys are getting, you know, some, some issues on the field and different things like that on the class. So I think Coach had to get a little bit more strict with this. But we those guys, man, like, man, we just wanted just to play free. We wanted to fly around, play for each other, and um, just and just win some games, man, be, and be respected. You know, that was the thing. And I think, you know, Coach, I think after a while, I think he, he he got the idea. He was like, you know what? It may be a crazy bunch. I just got to let them go. But I'm going to keep them close to me just, you know, just in case. And I'm going to make sure we, we, you know, keep our eyes on the prize. But, man, it was a great plan with those guys, man. Those guys were fun, man. And, you know, it was like, you know, going out there. I looked to my right, man. I got Brandon Flowers locking it down. I mm. looked to my left. I got Macho, Macho Harris holding his side down. Then I got the young Cam Chancellor just roam, roaming around. Mm-hmm. Silent killer ready to knock somebody's head off. It was just like, you know, the 9 11 with the DB and, and, and Vince Hall up front running the sideline to sideline. And then you got Barry Booker and Chris Ellis and Carlton Powell, you know, plugging up the gaps. It's like, come on, man. Like, you know, they can't mess with you us. You know, before I make the other comment about that defense, one reason Beamer probably didn't let y'all really go loose is because during my time, we had characters too. <laughs> and we didn't have social media like y'all did, so he probably was having traumatic flashbacks to the guys that were off the chain that he didn't reel in. But, you know, you mentioned the guys on that defense, bro, and I really feel like the DBU legacy, I think the kid Caleb Farley at Tech now reminds me of what you just mentioned with Macho and those guys. But for a little while, it's kind of been more about what used to be and what you were part of versus what it should be right now. And when you look at your DBU legacy and what you're part of, I know you were very aware of the guys that came before you. You mentioned playing for Torian Gray and, and Coach Whammy Ward. Um, Torian, who played with me, who to me is one of the best defensive minds I've ever been around. Um, I mean, to play with Macho and those guys, man, like it had to be fun, but also it was almost like, you guys, you play. You you had to be so confident. It, no, no receiving core could you, you feared no one, right? Yeah. <laughs> no, every week, man, we went we we went in very confident in the game plan. It was like we can do whatever, you know. And we knew we had two special players in Macho and Brandon. So my whole mindset was like, you know what? I can just sit back here and just place in the field. You know, I'm like, hey, you know, and it's funny we got so comfortable with with Tory and Gray to the point where he said corners, you feel like you can make a play, I want you to jump it. And DJ, I want you to have their back. And that's what Cam and I did. So that, those two, I won't say those two years, man, Macho and Flowers got their hands on a lot of balls, man, a lot of pass breakups. And it was just a communication thing, man. They, they knew that they can rely on me. You know, they can just look at me and give me an eye and say, hey, I'm going to get this thing. I'm telling them, go get it. I got you. You know? And, yeah. you, know they, you know, they ran a route. They picked it and we're going to run away. So it was that type of you know, relationship that we had in that DB room, man. Just across the defense, you know, across, across the board, man. We was just, we just one unit. We went everywhere together. We all went out, hung out, party together. You know, we was over each other's house playing video games and doing whatever, man. So we knew we had something special um, there. And it was funny. It was like that weird transition for us. We love Coach Ward. Like, I got there, Coach Ward, you know, he's a player coach. 
Mm -hmm. He has so much swag. You know, mm -hmm. he lets you play free, do what you want to do. You know what I'm saying? So when, it, when Coach Ward, you know, went off to, to, to a different job, it was that weird period when Coach, Coach Gray came. We knew about Coach Gray, but I think we were so trained to do what Coach Ward taught us, we had to, like, really switch our mindsets. And uh, it was two different styles for me. Coach Ward was more of a, he just let you play. Line up, do what you do, whatever you feel comfortable with. Just don't get beat deep, make a play, you know? Yeah. And Coach, Coach Torian came in, it was more like, no, we, we're going to play with technique. You know, we're going to play with, you know, discipline. We're going to, you know, eyes out the backfield. You know, it was like like a technician. Like, you was just, you know, you know it was just, you, everything was just tight. Not saying that Coach Ward didn't teach that, but it was just two different coaching styles, you know? Yeah. So um, it, it was me having to adjust to that. You know, I played corner my first year, my freshman year, I was a corner. I backed up Eric Green in the field. Cool. So, um, you know, Coach, Coach Beamer, Coach Foster came to me sophomore year. It was like, hey, the DB room is kind of crowded. We have some great DBs. We don't know what we want to do. But we know we got a young stud and Brandon Flowers who we love in the boundary. And we got Roland Minor, who we think is going to be a, you know, maybe first, second round draft pick at corner, you know, 6'2", you know, 215, running a 4'3". Like, you know, he's a prototypical corner. But it's like, you've been playing great for us. We got to get you on the field somehow. So they said, how do you feel about moving to free safety? We think you can pick it up quick. I said, hey, why not? This gets me on the field faster. Let's do it, you know? Um, so I, I took that on and moved to free safety, and it worked out for the best. Yeah, you know, and you mentioned um, it working out for the best. What I remember, too, is that 2003 team, I've, uh, I, I've been on record saying that team was loaded with talent, too, with, uh, you know, Ernest Wilford, Brian Randall. Um, that team, you know, Ke yeah, Kevin Jones, Hall, KJ. Hall, I mean, but they went eight and four, eight and five, I believe. They did have the big win over Miami, broke their 31 game winning streak in Lane Stadium. That was my official visit night. Yeah, 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 it was ridiculous. That, that Lane Stadium was, was all, you know, off the chain. Eric Green had that pick six. I mean, they, they were killing Brock, the quarterback in Miami. I mean, it was, it was, it was, I mean, they didn't even really kill it on offense. I mean, you had yeah. Marcus that went in and threw that touchdown That's to Ernest right. Wilford over uh, yeah. Sean Taylor. But yeah. I remember that team underachieve, and then all of a sudden, you know, as talented as they are, you know, we lose some guys, and then we're going into the ACC. And in that 2004 and 2005 team, you know, you guys, you know, even 2006, it's almost like there was a resurgence. Mm -hmm. You know, and it set the tone for a nice run in the ACC and a very, a, a really, what you guys started, you know, you really became the class of the ACC because Florida State was in transition. You guys used to punch Clemson in the mouth regularly. Um, and you guys became the class of the ACC, which was great for me as an alumni and a fan and former player to watch, man. Um, what do you remember about that? Because I remember your games and you in particular. And one of my favorite games, I remember I probably watched it tons, was when you guys went to Clemson yeah. in Death Valley, a night game. Yeah. You had a pick six and pointed to the crowd. Macho had a 101-yard kickoff return. Eddie Royal went crazy. crazy yeah. he, had two put, he had two uh, punt returns for touchdowns. Yeah. One got called back. Uh -huh. um, and he, I mean... What what was y'all mindset going in that night? Was it because it looked like y'all played like somebody said something before the game, or I mean, you guys went into Clemson and Death Valley and gave them a, a, a crazy loss, and that was Tyrod's first start as a true freshman. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We went into that week, man. We heard a bunch of talking. You know, they were always hyping up. Uh, they had the backs, uh, James Davis, C.J. Spiller. That was yeah. like lightning and thunder, and they were supposed to be all world. So I remember Xavier Devi and Vince Hall was like. The whole week saying, all right, we're about, we about to take these boys out. We're about to handle these boys. And then you hear about the entrance when they coming down the hill and yeah. oh, it's, oh, it's intimidating, this and that. So we like, all right. So we get down there. And I remember it being like oh, 95, 100 degrees. It was hot. It was a hot oh, yeah. day. I played there. It's hot. Yeah, it was it's hot. Nice. And um, <laughs> it was funny, man. Like, you know, I think I, I got the pick six early. That, that Like the first drive. I got, I you you the set house. the tone. You set, set the, the tone. tone. Took one to the house, and um, I think it's just, it just set it off from there. And it's funny, that whole week, we watched film, and Coach Gray was – this is what Coach Gray is really good at. He's really good at breaking down situations and plays and making you remember, like, down in distances and tendencies and different things like that. Like, he drills that in your head. 
Clemson used to always do this thing. They used to always do bubble screens when they had like a lot of scat guys, Jacoby Ford and all those guys. The coach is like, they ever in this formation, they doing this and doing that. They love to run these bubble screens. He's like, all right, cool, cool. So man, here we go. We like, I thought I did my pick six. I think we line up again. They get in this formation. All our eyes light up big. So we looking at each other, we calling it out. They run a run a bubble screen. Macho Harris come up. Boom. Knock a receiver out the game. <laughs> next thing you know, I feel like the next series of the series after, they try to run the bubble screen to the other side. Brandon Flowers come up, boom, knock the receiver out. So it was just like, we were just laying the hats on them, man. And then um, I think the offense fed off of us. Um, you know, I think Tyrod did something to us as well. We were so high on Ty, and we were so hyped, and we wanted him to play so bad as a freshman. Yeah. I think we just wanted that change. And uh, so when Ty came in, it, it, it gave us a whole different swag. We was like, all right, let's go get the young boy at the QB. Let's just give him the ball back. You know what I'm saying? And that was our whole mindset. I think we took that on, like, the rest of the season. That, that's, what, that's the way we played. Yeah, because you had that tough loss to start the season, or well, second game against uh, LSU, correct? Yeah. And it was, yeah, uh, that was, 40, that was embarrassing. We went down there and got our butts handed to us. But I remember yeah. that because it was a big, highly touted game. It was a night game in, in Baton Rouge, but Tyrod got the only touchdown. And um, mm -hmm. I forgot the guy's name, but the All-American defensive tackle said when Tyrod came in the game, that's when you saw it was a change. Even though they put 44 against us, they acknowledged that Tyrod was a difference maker. And, you know, it, 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 when I look back on my time and your, your era and the, even the guys who's come after you, and Tech has had so much talent. But I got to say, that team, those, those teams you were on, because typically Tech's defense – for years has carried the torch and set the tone for the entire team. Beam and ball would follow along with the offense. And we've had some great offensive players. You mentioned Tyrod, but you go back to the days of Jim Drunkenmiller, you got Al Clark and uh, Marcus Parker, Chiron. You got guys for days. Yeah. But that team actually on offense had Josh Morgan, Eddie Royal, Justin Harper, Hyman, Hyman. you know, yeah. Brandon Orr, running back. Brandon Orr, running back. Tyrod. Yeah. yeah. Are you? Loaded, bro. I mean, dude. It, Loaded. It, and then I remember, and I hate to bring this up, but it seemed like every era at Tech has that, man, I can't believe we lost that game and it haunts you forever. For me, it was one of the most embarrassing losses. The Temple at home, homecoming loss, and we were ranked 14th, and it was at the time, and even now, because it's still one of the worst upsets in college football history. You guys welcome Matt Ryan to Blacksburg. And everyone has said leading up, if you win that game, even though y'all had that horrible loss at LSU, you're going to jump back up yeah. into the national championship picture. And you had that pick. I saw it. You, you, know, they, you, you, caught, you caught that pick. You had a great pick that night. Um, and Chris Ellis is killing that tackle because he turns to the TV and he gives them the money <laughs> sign. I'm getting paid. Because <laughs> he was. I was in my living room saying, oh, I said, Chris Ellis is getting paid tonight. Matt Ryan looked like he had never played football before. It was raining, and Eddie Royal caught the only touchdown. It was only 10 nothing. And then all of a sudden, Matt Ryan got hot, and we ended up losing 14-10, and man. Obviously, you guys avenged that loss and won the ACC, but do you ever think back with all the guys I named on offense and defense, that amazing coaching staff? I know it's college football, but do you ever think back, man, if we don't lose that game, we're going to win a national championship? because. I mean, you got to all the way up to number three in the BCS to yeah. end the regular season at number three. Yeah. Because LSU yeah. was the first ever two-time loss, two-loss team to ever play in a national championship game. Yeah. I wish you could see my, some of my, my, my group chats with, with the fellas, man. We talk about that all the time, man. Um, that, that, that game, the Boston College is probably one of the, the, the most that, – that game still haunts me to this day. Um, you know, we one of those defenses, hey, we, we gonna bend, but we ain't gonna break, you know? Mm -hmm. And we used to always go into it and say, hey, look, we used to tell the offense, we gonna keep them below 17. All y'all gotta do is score more than 17. You know, that was, that was our motto. Um, and we just, we just couldn't, it, it was frustrating at times that we couldn't really hang the points on the board that we needed, you know? Like, we get you the ball back, we need you guys to finish. I remember that Boston College game, getting the interception, and I think it was the fourth quarter, maybe like six minutes left. I think we were on like I 40 going in. So we think, oh, this is over. It's 10 zip. 
we punched this in. It's a wrap. And uh, I want to say we went three and out, something like that. I believe, if I remember, y'all went three and out, and he and and the offense didn't do. They did a quick kick, or they did a they yeah. shotgun quick kick or something. Kick. Yeah, and then but BC got the ball back, and I remember I was at home watching with my wife, and she looked at me. And she said, "Man, I don't know," because you could feel it. Yeah. Because you know, I when you got that pick, you went over there because they were interviewing Vince Hall on the sideline because he was injured. And yeah. he was over there with the sunflower seeds <laughs> talking to the people. And then you had Tyrod who couldn't play because he had the high ankle sprain. Yeah. And it's not blaming Glennon. It's just more so the offense and there were injuries. But you still were dominating them. Yeah. And then momentum just switched. You know, Uncle Mo went on the other side, man. And, you know, I, I'm glad you guys still talk about it, even though we're grown now. It's still – because I always wonder if you guys have won that game, you know. Yeah. That, that game, Vic, that, that hurt us right there because we won that game. Like I said, that would put us in, in, in great contention for, you know, maybe getting a national title shot. But now also, I go back to my junior year. Uh, no, it was in my junior year. It was my, my sophomore year when Marcus was our quarterback. That was probably my – I had the most fun that year. That was probably my best year just being a part of a team because Mark brought us so much swag. And I think everyone wanted to play with Mark. And we – like, he was our leader. And – he just, even though B. Ram was a great quarterback, we love B. Ram. But when B. Ram left, he was like, all right, it's the Vic era. So everyone was like on, um, on excited about it. And uh, we rolled in that year. And uh, Miami, we had to play Miami late that year. They came in. And we knew, we said, hey, dog, if we win this game, we might get this shot. We can win the ACC. You know, they got to put us in this natty talk. And Miami came in there, man, handed it to us, man. And we we lost that game. That that was a gut gut blow for us, man, because we knew that we we blew it. That was our chance right there. So it seemed like we always, man, with tech gets in that spotlight, man. We always just fall short, man, drop the ball. I don't know how it is, man. But it always yeah, happens. yeah. I mean, I've I've said that. I had Bill Roth on my other podcast, and he made a good point. He said, unless you win it, all teams talk like that. And he's not wrong, the legendary voice of the Hokies, but at the same time. You know, my thing is, I, I admit, when I was there, we dropped the ball, but we were part of the classes that were building and setting everything up for you guys. So we didn't yeah. have, and we had talent, and we had some great teams, and we, but we were setting the tone. The expectations weren't what they were with your programs. And you mentioned my cousin, Marcus, that squad. Listen, yeah. I just knew y'all were going to beat Miami, but the offense had six or seven turnovers. And, yeah. you know, and it's crazy because they ended up a few weeks later wetting the bed against Georgia Tech. You guys backdoored into the, the ACC yeah. championship and went down and gave UVA one of the worst <laughs> L's they've ever taken. I mean, 52 to 14. Yeah. And my guy Marcus Hagan was his quarterback. And I remember watching that, like, you know, Marcus, man, with that team, I can see why you said that was the, the funnest team you've ever been on. Because Marcus, you know, Mike was quiet. And I try to tell all my friends, you know, you and I live in Northern Virginia, so there's a strong tech alumni base in the DMV. I mean, tech alumni between North Carolina and the DMV is heavy up here. And I tried to warn my friends in, at, in Tyson's and at Booz Allen and Hamilton. You know, I was like, hey, Marcus is different. He is bad news. He's going to talk trash. You're not going to see a quarterback that's going to talk. And I know he, you know, you can say what you want, love him or hate him. I love him. I know yeah. you do too. But I like the fact he played like that. I yeah. like the fact that he went at defensive ends and yeah. threw linebackers. I like the fact that he would tell coach to go for it. And when y'all went to Morgantown, he gave the Mountaineer fans some love. You know, I, I, that to me, that team was, again, another team you were on. That's why I said you guys set the tone. And once again, you guys, there was talk that week after y'all smashed UVA that if you beat Florida State, you never know. You know, because you guys were ranked high, you went back up to BCS. I believe y'all got all the way up to five or four. And yeah, we were yeah. five. And Miami was ranked, I think, a little bit before, something like that. We were high. Yeah, and then you lose to Florida State. And that yeah. Florida State yeah. team came into the ACC championship game losing three out of four. They weren't even really a good team. And if y'all won that game, y'all would have played Penn State in the Orange Bowl. Exactly, um, so, yeah. You know, it's, it's tough. I mean, I'm sure you guys talk about it because I'm older than you and we still every now and then at cookouts we get together and be like, bro, man, if we win yeah. that game. We dropped the ball, man. <laughs> <laughs> we say it every time, like, bro, how we lose that one, man? We messed it up, man. Messed do you, up. do you, do you, when you guys talk, and I, I know a lot of the guys you talk to in your group chat and they're all great people, but they're all real guys. They're real people. Um, 
and I mean that in sincerity, man. They just keep it real. Do you guys – it's not blame, is it? It's not so much like, you know, man, um, Bima should have done this or we should have ran this. Because I know defensively, you know, sometimes you look at the offense, man, like if y'all would have just done this, or is it just more so reflected in general, like, you know, just talking football, like, you know what, we just should have won that game. I don't know. I think it's reflecting in general, but sometimes, man, if you talk to a defensive guy, they're blaming on the offense. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, it's like, hey, come on, man. Y'all, you know, like, man, we, y'all couldn't give us 21? I'll give us 21, man. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> or, you know, your, or, or the quarterback situation, like, ah, you know, we, you know, Tyrod was in the game or whatever the case may be. You know, my, my, my good boy, Justin Harper, man, like my, one of my best friends and one of my favorite teammates, man, he, he'll tell you straight up how it was. Uh, we suck. We didn't, we didn't do this. Offensive, you know, the, the, the plays that week were, were, were trash, you know, whatever the case may be. But um, I think just overall, man, in general, man, we, we just think about those games, just think, talk about how we dropped the ball, man. But depending on what the day is, we'll blame it on the offense or we'll blame it on the, on the game plan or whatever the case may be, man. It's just – depends on what day you catch us on. You know, before we talk about life after tech, man, um, I do want to ask you your thoughts. You and I have become friends over in recent years, and we talk on Twitter. You and I, we, I've seen you at the FedEx games when tech plays locally. And you are, you're a very real person. You don't, and the thing I love about, like I mentioned earlier about your tweets and our conversations, it's not about blame with you. It's not about, you know, being negative. You're just honest. And that's rare these days because you're not like you you want to see tech win. You want to see us dominate. When you look at tech now, and I know there's a new coaching staff. I am happy. Shout out to you know Justin um Hamilton and um you know Daryl Tapp and, and those guys, man, and Pearson Prelo, some of the guys that play who are in the coaching staff. I'm happy about that. But when you if you could give your synopsis of tech right now in order because they got a great team allegedly coming back. Like this is a team most publications already have them with 13 preseason all ACC players. Most publications have them picked to win the Coastal. If not them, it's Carolina with them number two. Um, they were young last year. They have a lot of guys back, if not 80-some percent of their roster. But all those analytic, analytics aside, when you look at Tech right now, what do they need to do to get back to – what we just described, you know, your era. Forget my era. I'm talking about your era. What do they got to do? And, and just, you know, whether it's recruiting, philosophy, identity, what do you think? Because Brendan Hill makes some good points and other guys make their points. And this is your legacy. And you were there and you were, had a great legacy at Tech. Um, you were one of the better defensive backs to ever play there. But what do you think they needed to do? Honestly, Big, I think they just got to find their identity. Identity, man. I don't think we have any identity right now. I think we kind of in this crisis. Like we're between the two. Like, uh, do we are we the old tech or are we the, uh, the new tech? You know, I think we kind of right in the middle right now. Um, hopefully, they 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 find themselves, you know, uh, this, this season. But I think they just, you know, we gotta just, you know, uh, as far as I don't know how that works. I know we've been kind of going into Texas and doing all these other things. And kids are so different these days, man. They commit, decommit. You know, they blow with the wind, man. You know what I'm saying? I think you got to really find out what your program is going to be about and find the really the core guys who fit your system, you know, and, and build from, from there. Um, again, build inside out. I think everything is getting to, like, you know, air raid and spreading out. Like, hey, man, the team starts from inside out. You know, from day one, man. You got your, your guys up front ain't strong, and you, you got a strong team. So, you know, and another thing is I think we need to, we need to find – the, the good backs, that's always been our staple, man. I don't know why we, we, we struggle, you know. I know we try to do it by committee these days, but we always had a back at Tech. You know, we kept two backs, three backs at Tech. You know what I'm saying? So um, doing that, just finding our identity, but mixing it up, you know, we want to air it out, let's do that. You know, but let's just find who we are, man. Let's, and let's, let's play defense um, and, and get the special teams rolling. I'm very excited about Justin Hamilton, man. So happy for my brother, man. I think he's going to do a great job. Uh, you know, he, he is tech, you know, he, he's from there. I think the kids are going to really, uh, you know, listen to him, believe in him because he's played there. He know what it takes. Um, you got tap there, man. Tap is the ultimate hokey. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah, no question. And he's the ultimate hokey and, and the, the kids are going to really believe in him. He's going to get them where they need to be. So the fact that we're bringing some of our guys back and getting them in the building, I think that's going to help tremendously. Um, but then also, man, like, I think we got to raise the bar a little bit. I think for so long, me personally, I think the bar's been pretty low for Virginia Tech. Even when I was there, it was always, hey, let's just try to win 10 games. If we win the ACC, that's a good season. 
You know, like, look, man, we've been doing that for a long time. We've been there and done that. Let's time, let's time to raise the bar. Let's, 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 get, let's get in the mix a little bit here. Let's start talking about playoffs. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? If, you, if you're not talking about it in that building, it's not going to happen. Boom. You know what I'm saying? got to set that goal and say, hey, let, hey, fellas, this is our goal. Let's go get it. And I hope they're doing that around there because it's, it's time for it's time for a change. You know, we 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 didn't dominate the ACC. We we won some championships. It's time to start getting these playoff mixes and start being in the conversations with the Clemsons and the LSU's and you know all these other schools. like, hey man, we can be right there with you. So, you know, COVID to slow things down, but I hope those boys can can get in the building soon and get that you know that relationship that camaraderie built, man, and, and kind of hit the ground running, man. So. Yeah, no. I have faith in it. I agree. I agree. Um, just a little bit more, a few more questions. When you were done at Tech, you mentioned Dwayne Brown and all those guys. I mean, the DV, I know he went with the Houston Texans. Yeah. And um, Macho was with Philadelphia for a little bit. And, and all the different guys uh, that you played with. I mean, some talent. Chris Ellis, I believe he was with the Buffalo Bills for a second. Um, what what was your situation like? What happened for you after you graduated, and, and and what did you end up doing? Did you get a free agent deal? Did you did you go try out, or were you like, you know, when I'm done? Like, what what was your situation? Yeah, so I ended up getting a free agent deal. Um, it's funny, I, you know, my senior year, I think I had like a third, fourth round grade, something like that. So I'm coming in feeling kind of good in my senior year, just hey, if I if I play solid, don't mess this up, you know, I'm gonna hear my name called. Fortunately, that didn't happen, but you know, um, as soon as the seventh round, you know, I had four or five options um, as far as teams who wanted to offer me a free agent deal. Um, decided to go to San Francisco, so I signed with them, uh, went out there um, and went through the whole camp, you know, was there for a little bit, but then they ended up releasing me and letting me go. Uh, but it was, it was a good experience, you know, and I, I did the thing as far as like I was trying to hang on and work out and should I go play in Canada, should I go play arena ball and all this and all that, but um, after my experience with San Francisco, man, and I think the phone stopped ringing, I stopped hearing from the engine, and, you know, I, I know how the game is. Um, I kind of lost love for it, Vic. I lost love for it, man. And I said, you know what? I think that's it. That's my ride, you know? I think it's where, where the buck is. I always thought of myself as an overachiever, you know what I'm saying? Like, always the underdog. People didn't really know about me, but I ended up turning out to being okay. So I said, you know what? If this is it, you know, I'm cool with that. So um, I would probably say, after the, you know, that, that first year I was out, that second year I was still working on training, but then I just lost love for it. And I said, it's time to move on. It's time to find some, something else to do and start my, start my life, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, I decided to kind of just, you know, take my staff at the corporate grill and never look back. Yeah, you know, and, and, you, and I know you saw my tweet the other day, man, and it's funny because I don't think the average fan, even – the people viewing this video, unless they play, and it's nothing against fans because you guys are knowledgeable and you know what you're talking about for the most part. What I'm referring to is awareness of how hard it is to make it in the NFL. Even if you get drafted in the fifth or sixth or seventh round, or even the fourth round, or even in the first, I don't think people realize, like, you know, you got released, I got released. Um, it's a lot of guys, man, people say, oh, Macho didn't have this. Listen, man, the NFL is political. It's about where you go. Uh, sometimes they got nine guys at your position, and all those guys were all conference, all American, and you know they want to keep these three because of relationships. Money gets involved. Sometimes it's just a matter of getting the right snaps at the right time. And you know, I know you don't look down at your career, neither do I. First of all, you said you were okay. You were great. You were great. I mean. You know, so don't don't minimize your success. I know you're a humble brother, but I just want to say that at the end of the day, you know, people don't realize, man, it's real. Like, it is so difficult. Um, offensively, defensively, special teams, the NFL has never kept a large roster. If you think about a 53-man roster, that is not a lot of people. <laughs> They're going to keep a lot of bodies. So you think 90. about it, you know, 40 of us getting chopped off the Yeah, yeah. And the only reason they do that is because they need those bodies to practice and scrimmage. And bodies, they, that's it. They're just using you. I mean, and again, that's yeah. a great story. I watch Hard Knock, but yeah. I, I watch the show. I say, he ain't going to make it. He ain't got enough room. He's just using yeah. him for this TV show. It's you know, crazy. So I, I go, I go in the, I go in the, uh, you know, get there in San Francisco. So I think we had 12 DBs in the, in the DB room. I, said, right, I start counting, I start doing the math. And I'm looking at who's the starter, who's the backup. So the starters were big money guys. They just got paid contracts to make it eight, nine, ten million a year. So they there. 
those two positions are, are locked in. The backups, um, Deshaun Gosen was just drafted a year before I me. Mean, he was a good safety for um, San Francisco in the middle of Super Bowl years. Um, and then he also, I think he worked the Redskins and the Bucks. I was backing him up. So I was a third string. And he was like a third, second round draft pick, fourth round draft pick, whatever. But they were really high on him. So I knew, I was like, look, I'm not going to get no burn at DB. I got to get on this special team. But then at, at, the, at that time, I mean, it's like me and 15 other guys battling for the special team spot. You know what I'm saying? It's the numbers just weren't adding up. So I knew it was like, you know what? I know my chances are slim. I'm just going to leave it all out on the field and, you know, see what happens. You know? I did that. And, you know, it worked out in the long run. But, you know, it was a great experience. You know, I can you know, tell people like, oh, yeah, I, I had a shot at the league. You know, at least I can get that opportunity. You know yeah, you know, and football, I won't say the only sport, but it feels like this. I mean, I can say it. It's our show. <laughs> but football, yeah. football ends abruptly. Like, yeah. like, you know, my son is a basketball player. And you have the G League now. You can play overseas. I mean, even when Iverson was done playing, he played in China for a year. You know, Marbury went across seas and they're resurrecting his career. Um, and you have so many avenues. Football ends abruptly. And, you know, you know, CFL, arena football, you know, will fold and reopen and fold. Um, and whether it's injury or opportunity, it ends. And, I mean, you're, you're losing the love. I think many guys I've interviewed and talked to just from a group chat or even at a get-together, we all go through that because you, here you go, you're playing at this university or, you, you know, you're doing well. And all of a sudden, you know, you have all these great feelings of euphoria and success. And especially if you're a starter like yourself and, and making plays and highly known, like you're, you're a household name, and then it ends. Yeah. abruptly and then you go to a place pride, where man. yeah it does it it does it hurts your pride i mean listen many of us go through it and, it, and the thing about it is it's not even so much i don't want to get all deep and say it's not fair but you get to a program in the nfl where it's really a business um you know i when i interviewed cornell brown recently him and jc price we talked about it because cornell was in baltimore when i went there i was there for mini camp and i got released real quick because they were going through a coaching transition and Cornell was like, don't look down on yourself, man. It's a business, man. He was like, this ain't even about you. It's numbers. And I remember Ozzie Newsom told me, he was like, hey, you're a good player. We just don't have room for you right now, man. Now, but people back home on Shell Road and Wickham Avenue and Newport News and South Side of Richmond and places like that, they just your fam. They your fam and they your friends. So they don't understand fully why you don't make it. Because all they know is DJ Parker killed it at Phoebus, killed it at Tech. And then why he ain't getting a shot? Why he ain't get his name called? You know, it's tough. Back home with us, I'm happy. You know, they yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. But you now you're in corporate America. Um, you live in Northern Virginia. You're married. You're doing very well. And um, I know for me and a lot of your friends, we're happy for you. And you're doing Thank great. You, and now you transition into what it was all about—the game of life and mm-hmm. being a productive member of the community and also being a family man or being, you know, someone that other people behind you can look up to. Um, with that being said, DJ, I allow my guests, you know, everybody that comes on to talk about what the game has taught them so far, what has life taught you. This is your opportunity to give your final thoughts from someone watching this show, some feedback, you know, any words of encouragement, any something motivational. What has life taught you so far, not just at Virginia Tech and football, but just in general, the life lessons that you want to give uh, some thoughts on to people watching this right now. Yeah, for sure. Man. I appreciate it, Dave. So I, I, I'll tell you a story, man, um, for myself personally, um, you know, playing ball. And like you said, you know, you get to the league, you know, that's your ultimate goal, ultimate dream, you know, so you kind of put all your eggs in that one basket a little bit. But funny story about me, um, I, I did pretty bad in high school as far as grade wise, but you know, it's funny, I never struggled in college. Like my grades were, were, were great in college. And um, I knew I wanted to play in the league, but you always hear that story about, you know, football doesn't last forever, you know, average years, you know, three or four years for a player if you're blessed. And uh, so I went to that same mindset thinking like, all right, I need to figure out what's my plan B. And I think my message, you know, I want to I relay here is for the, the guy that we're playing now in the younger generation, as far as it's okay to have a dream to, you know, to go pro and, and play pro, but just understand that um, sometimes it's not going to work out that way. So you got to be sure that you're setting yourself up to have a plan B or even a plan C. Uh, for me, um, it's funny. Going into 
my senior year, I was a residential property management uh, major, and we had to do an internship, you know, in order to, in order to graduate. A lot of the guys would say, "Well, I'm just gonna do an internship. I'm just gonna just stay local and train here at the school." I said, "Well, uh, I'm actually I'm gonna go to this career fair and network and politics here. You know, talk you know talk to some of these companies who are coming, see what see what it's about." So I uh, there, and I you know. Uh, end up getting like four interviews, and I end up getting an internship with a with a company up here in Northern Virginia, real estate property company called Keller Management. They built a lot of development here in the Northern Virginia area. They built the the, uh, the capitals, practice facility, and all that and stuff. So I was doing that uh, for the summer, and I took a hit because I missed the whole first semester of working out because I did my internship. So I was basically up here in Northern Virginia working eight hours a day and trying to train myself after work to stay in shape for the season, going into camp, which wasn't the best, you know? Um, so I, I came back the second semester after the internship was done, a um, little out of shape, had to work myself into shape and get caught up with the other guys. Um, we went on to have a good year my senior year. But the one thing that, that, that saved me, Vic, was when football was over, when I was at home, I got cut from San Francisco and I was sitting on my mom's couch trying to figure out what I'm going to do with my life. I picked the phone up and I called that company back, called my old manager back. And uh, during that summer, I built so many great relationships, networked with a lot of people, met a lot of people, and uh, presented myself very well and did a good job that summer. And I called them and I said, hey, you know, football didn't work out, um, looking for a job. They said, we'd love to have you back. They said, can you interview next week? I said, man, no problem. Packed my bags up, Vic, drove up to Northern Virginia, did the interview, got the job. And from right there, man, that took off. So for me, it was a blessing in disguise, man, although it took me, a while to get into shape and get caught up. And I missed a lot of time with my team that first semester, but me building those relationships, me thinking about my future, knowing that football won't last forever, I think set me up to where I am right now. And I'm, I'm so fortunate and blessed that I, I had that forethought that four to think, hey, do this and it's gonna pay off in the long run. You know what I'm saying? So to the kids, the kids out there, man, shoot for your dreams, go pro, play in the league, you know, hopefully you all get to do that. But at the same time, man, be smart, and uh, think of a plan B and a plan C, just in case that doesn't work out because of football and sports on last play. Absolutely, man. Well said, man. There you have it from my man, DJ Parker, man. I just want to thank you again for jumping on. This was great. And like I say every week, when we have our legacy spotlight, no matter where you go, no matter what you do, make sure you leave a positive impact and a great legacy, man. Thank you, DJ. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs>